back, everyone. I'm Steffi D. And I'm Lisa H. And welcome to Check In From Away. This week, we are checking in with superstar Ennis Esmer. Thanks for joining us. Hey, Lisa, guess what? What? Today, we are interviewing and checking in with one of my favorite people I've ever worked with ever, Ennis Esmer. Yeah, it's a pretty big deal. Like, I think Check In From Away is now reaching celebrity status because, like, we have a superstar on the show. We really do. And also, I know the episodes are only 20 minutes long, and um, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. Ennis has so many credits on his resume, it would take 20 minutes to just read them all. But let me, like, tell our viewers a few things. If you're not familiar with Ennis, you should be. He's been in such shows as... Covert Affairs, The LA Complex, The Listener, Man Seeking Woman, Dark Matter, Red Oaks, Schitt's Creek, Private Eyes, Blind Spot, The Flash, and more importantly, we were on an episode of Frankie Drake together. Well, clearly that's why the show is canceled now because they just couldn't handle you and Ennis together on the screen. I know. And the other thing that's really cool that we're going to talk about, Lisa, is that me and Ennis's lives have often intertwined in the past. Ooh, I can't wait to hear all about it. Let's jump in. Hi, my name is Anna Sesmer, and this is Check In From Away, is what it says on the mugs. <laughs> Thank you so much for plugging our mugs. You and Steffi have quite a saucy history, don't you? I mean, uh... if we follow you back to 2013, <laughs> We have a little memory we want to play here. Uh, maybe we can chat a little bit about how you and Steffi first met. Steffi, do you want to share some of that with us? Yes, so, I'd love to hear all about this. So Ennis, um, us meeting for the first time was immortalized on the radio, on the air in February of 2013. Wow. Can you believe it? And I'm going to play a little 17 clip. years ago. <laughs> you have a clip? Are you ready? Yes, I'm very excited. Oh boy. Okay, here we go. <laughs> right? Yes. Um, so Ennis, I, I watched the listener in the LA complex. Wow. I'm a big fan. I think you're a really funny guy. Oh, geez, thank and you. um I made you a Valentine. You did? Yes. <laughs> oh, now and we're um it's really I think it's very clever. I hate to toot my own horn, but, you but did. it's I love making crafts. Oh, so I don't know if we can pass that oh, down. It's pretty funny. Okay, now hang on a minute. Let me just describe this. It is out of, you know, uh, beautiful uh, paper. Yeah, oh, yes. Construction paper. Yeah. Construction it's paper. also yes. 3D. It has a 3D heart on it. Has it has a pop-up element. Pop-up yeah, pop right. element? It has a what personalized does it message say? on the back. It says, hey, I just met you, and this is crazy, <laughs> but here's a Valentine, so pick me, maybe. <laughs> oh, Thank well, you. I that was pretty cool. So, Ennis, if I may give <sighs> our viewers some context. Oh, I'd um, love to. I mean, it may, or we just move on to the next thing. That would be great, too. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm kidding. Of course. That would, please tell them everything. Yes. It, all, I I'm sound kidding. like I, I, I smoked a pack of cigarettes right before we went on the air, and some of them are stuck in my throat. Just, just I, Some of them I just started chewing, like a chewing tobacco. Oh, bless but, you. Like, I, that's yeah. how I feel about me, too. I'm like, man, it was really early that morning. But essentially, yeah. to give our viewers some context, yeah, I um. Won a date with you on Chum FM in 2013, <laughs> um, Valentine's Day. Yeah. And we got picked up in this like limo car. We got taken to a beautiful restaurant. We had a like five course meal together. Mm -hmm. And then we went back on the air the next morning and we talked about the date and how it went. Right, and yes. So you and I have quite a history and what I want to know do. if you still have the Valentine or not. Of course. I do. You don't just get rid of a Valentine that you got from someone you don't know on a radio show that offered you to be a part of a bachelor style promotion that you thought would be good publicity for your independent play you were acting in at the storefront theater. Mm -hmm. You don't just get rid of stuff like that. You know what I mean? You save it. It's up on. The, you know what it is? I'm getting it reframed because the glass, it, it's fogging because it's been up for so long in the natural light. And 
you know how I don't want I don't have to get into the the the, the ins and outs of uh, of refraction and it's it, the way that it can damage even the finest of um, glass surfaces. But wow. yeah, it's yeah. A few years ago, yep. I went to the Marilyn Dennis show with my aunt and my mom, and I got called up to help uh, build this bench. And um, she recognized you do. me. Yeah, she did. Recognized she did. Me. She went, hey, Steffi, do I know you from the date that you won with Ennis Esmer? <laughs> like she Steel remembered. trap. That is, she must talk to like 30 different people a week. That's insane. Yes. And she remembered yeah. me from years prior. It was insane. That's yeah. See, she cares about us. Yes. Did you ever do a blind date on Chum FM? I sure did. <laughs> <laughs> yes. With a regular. With, with, with Ennis, uh, with Ennis yes, Esmer, right? right? Did. Yes. How did I it go? I thought I met her before. Really <laughs> the date went no, well. The date went really well. Right? It didn't work out between us. I know. It was oh. good. <laughs> I really want to know, like it didn't work out between the two of you. So was Steffi like a horrible date? Okay, uh, a couple things. I did have a girlfriend at the time who yes. had conceded to be, oh, uh, 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 well, it was an emotionally withholding relationship. Let me tell you. Um, but uh, I was, it really was sincerely, uh, I thought it would be good, like as a fun thing to do to promote a play that I was doing. But you know, that was part of it. It was just, it was sort of a weird sociological experiment unto its inside of one because all we were doing was observing how weird Valentine's Day is for people. The people that were out on these dinners that they just seemed like they would rather not, not, not let alone be on the dinner. They didn't want to be in that relationship anymore is what it looked like. <laughs> What's your favorite movie? Honestly, it's, uh, it, it, it is, it, it was and continues to be the Three Amigos. Favorite actor? Yeah. I mean, I guess if we're going in that direction, it's Steve Martin, probably. Favorite TV series? Seinfeld. It has to be Seinfeld. I could say, I'm ask my girl, she's downstairs, my girlfriend, but every time I see an actor in something else, I start telling her whether she wants to hear it or not, how I remember them from their one line on Seinfeld from 15 years before or after. Anyway, that's not rapid fire. Go ahead. Do you have a favorite musical? I can't stand them. <laughs> Wait, what? We would have never, we would have, we would have never worked out. No. I'm so sorry. It's trauma. For, it's not trauma. It's the wrong word, by the way. It's just, you know, theater, the musical theater community, it's, et cetera. It's tied into an ex-girlfriend. It's a long story. We don't, you're a, you are actually legitimately devastated, right? Now. Here's here. Okay. I'll just say this. And I feel like whether or not you like musicals or you love them or you don't, you know, they're, they're not, it's my issue. You know what I mean? You see something nice on the rack. You put, you say, that's a lovely outfit. You put it on. It's not for you. You know what I mean? It happens. Yeah. So that's, I am not here to impugn the artistic uh, uh, viability or relevance of the, of the, of the, of the theatrical musical. It's not my job here. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. But there are people who saw Cats and then decided to get into acting. Do you see where I'm going with this? Like someone saw that show in the 60s or 70s maybe where they all kind of had David Bowie hair. Like that's what a cat was. A cat had uh, a cat ass and genitals uh, presumably in the back, but then also like the male ones had like a human, you know, hump, if you will, or the, you know, the women maybe had like a discernible mons. Uh, <laughs> speaking of, so you didn't think anyone would ever say mons on your show, did you? Um, Watch that and then thought, that's what I want to do with my life. And I just find that the Venn diagram overlap of people who love and and want to be in musicals and people who like me who are just find them kind of uh, 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 fascinating, uh, although you know a world they don't understand. That's the overlap right there, and I just think that's 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 what Cats is to me. My parents uh, separated, and then my mother moved to San Francisco, and my father started working out of town for weeks at a time. And with that, you know, new paradigm of I had an apartment to myself. He would come back and cook food because he's the sweetest angel on planet earth but he was working in texas and he's working in connecticut and uh, of all the things that suffered in school because that's about the time i started feeling comfortable skipping classes i wasn't skipping theater classes because i was majoring in uh, theater at earl Hague secondary school a fine a fine fine arts school and uh i think that was when it started to click like oh this is the only thing i, I actually care to try try and so I mean, that's kind of it. Also within a, like, I'd say maybe a six month uh, window, I saw the movie Bottle Rocket, which is Wes Anderson's first movie with, and, and 
watched uh, Owen Wilson's performance in that and Swingers. And I was introduced to the Marvel that is Vince Vaughn. Uh, and between those two, you know, because as, I don't know if you could tell, but I really can get a ramble going. And those two, uh, I don't know. That was like, that was like, they're doing that in the, I think I, like, there's no way that's in the script. And, you know, it's led me to, it's led me this far. I'm 42 years old. And look at this. I have a nice railing back here. <laughs> Come on, you know this. This I got. The, I got. A, I got a, a thing, a screen on my microphone. I'm doing okay. Well, you know, auditioning and how stressful it can be. I recall one summer I was living in New York. I was working on a, a terrific television program named called Red Oaks, and uh, I had an audition on the weekend. I was doing it at a self taping studio, and it was for a movie that starred Jason Statham. That was about like a super giant shark. Something about a giant shark, and. I audition. I was playing like the tech guy in the submarine. It's like, oh, the shark's coming. We gotta we we can reconfigure the trajectory to get the shark. And we, we, are you out of your mind? We gotta move. You know that guy. And uh, I put together what I thought was a pretty decent audition. And then I got a note back from my uh, agents that, much like I probably do now, yeah, I had pretty sweaty armpits during the audition because it was hot. It was like forty degrees Celsius in New York. It was in the summer, and um, so. I was like, yeah, okay. And they said, well, they would, they kind of want you to redo it. And um, I could not really, I mean, the movie was set on a submarine with a bunch of like bandits trying to hunt down a giant shark. One would assume it was relatively humid down there and that there might be, there might be some sweating involved. So after much uh, 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 resistance, I capitulated. I decided to go ahead and do it again. And, uh, and wouldn't you know it, I had what someone might call a kind of an upset stomach that morning when I had booked that second audition. Now, keep in mind, I'm very happy with the first take. Okay, so I did a little thing where I was like, hey, I'm gonna bring two shirts. I'm gonna wear a shirt and I'm gonna bring a second shirt, which I will wear once I get there. All is going according to plan. Switch shirts when I get there, dry off, I'm feeling great. But wouldn't you know it, nature calls right before I'm about to go. So um, I don't know if you knew this was gonna be the kind of story it was, but. Uh, also, can you hear that sizzling shrimp downstairs? Because you know, oh, get you a woman that can get you a woman who can do both. No, I want to make everybody jealous. Uh, with oh, the shrimp. Yeah. And my my darling Amy is making shrimp tacos downstairs because it's summer. Yeah. Anyway, so I go um, take care of business, and then, uh, well, uh, through just one of life's cruel tricks, the toilet ends up plugging. Um, so now in the shirt that I've switched into, I am unplugging a toilet because etiquette dictates and demands that I do so. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm not going to, I've gone to this casting studio. I, there's no way in hell that I am going to leave a plug. It's just, I don't want anybody, you know, if this ever happens in a hotel, you know, I like to use Charmin Ultra Soft. It's a nice toilet paper. Sometimes it, if you use too much, it plugs up the toilet. I'm getting a real Vince Vaughn thing going on right now. That wasn't the case here. Anyway, long story short. I managed, they had a plunger, I unplugged the toilet, go in for the audition. The second we start, I notice I am just as sweat. I am way worse off than I was the first time. Huge pit stains. So I have no recourse but to be like, you know what? You asked for it, you get a second tape. Here we go, just as sweaty. I re-record the thing, do it just as well. And then they switch the part to a female. Stop. No, that's it. It's like George Costanza, like truly like Susan dated him and then no. became a lesbian. It was like they were just like, you know what? If this is men, let's make this a female role. Um, you know what? I think it would have to be. I mean, the experience of working on uh, Red Oaks. Yeah, drink this. <coughs> what is this? Head of the dog. Absolute and Gatorade. Uh, can't do it, man. I'm hurting so bad, I can't do it. David. Why, Nash, why do you care? Uh, t -t 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 don't. Look, I'm building up to something. Don't betray my motivational speech. Okay. I suppose you remind me of myself when I was your age. I mean, you're, you're more of a white person. Clearly less well endowed from what I can see through those delicate shorts, but gifted. Lot of heart, lot of hustle. Also, none of the other applicants I interviewed would agree to the shitty split you accepted on the hourly rate. 60-40? Oh, Jesus, what a schmuck. Oy. You can't have a bucket list for something that unbelievably incredible. Uh, for the few, I can't imagine anybody in your listenership has not watched this show, but uh, uh, I had just finished shooting The Listener, uh, uh, hit paramedic procedural soft science fiction uh, hospital dramedy on CTV. Um, and, uh, you know, as you do, you go into your post-employment depression 
And I, I, I had not yet at this point, I was about 33, really, really tried growing a beard at all. And so I didn't work for about a month and I had, uh, I had uh, something like what you see here. And then I got an audition for like, uh, you know, a, an aging golf pro kind of Lothario bearded Middle Eastern uh, English accent. I was like, well, that's weird. I have a beard now. So I went and did that. And uh, I mean, the whole thing would have to count as the experience, like would be the memory. You know what I mean? Because like I, I did a self tape and sometimes you get a call uh, from your representation and you kind of know it's good news. Like you have a sense maybe. And I was like in Houston visiting my cousin, we were at a movie, Meg. No, it's not true. I can't remember what movie. It was Cats. No, I can't remember what the movie was, but I, they called and I was like, oh, I think this is good news. And I had gotten the part. But even to then, I'd say that one of the greatest, I'll flip it with the, the one of the best audition experiences I ever had. I, I was lucky enough to go down to New York um, to audition for it. And I had not spent a lot of time in New York ever. I think when I was a kid, we went to the Statue of Liberty. It, sounded, it was terrifying, this idea of New York. Um, and uh, David Gordon Green is one of the executive producers. I don't know if you're familiar with his work, but Eastbound and Down, The Righteous Gemstones, a ton of independent films that sort of made his uh, his name in the business. But he, you know, he co-wrote and directed the Halloween reboot. Like he's just all over the place, and he's a genius in slayers. But um, it went from oh, they 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 want to fly you down to, or they want you to fly yourself down to New York to re-audition off the tape, which doesn't happen, I don't think, but. Uh, then it, like within an hour, it turned into, oh no, they're flying you down. They want you to test. It's down to like you and one other guy. So I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> like I was just doing, a, you know, uh, I've never tested for anything. This is the first time I ever did anything like this off a of tape. And so I went down there and the audition was about 45 minutes of just me and uh, Carmen Cuba, who's a phenomenal cast director. If you look her up, she's done a lot of Steven Soderbergh stuff. Uh, Steven Soderbergh, also an executive producer on this movie, on this show, like, kill me, Jesus. Um, uh, now, what will you censor there? Kill or Jesus? I'm really curious. But Neither. So I get in the room and we're doing the scene and um, there's a, there's a, basically we, we run it a couple of times and I'm doing it with the actor, an actor who did not get the part of the, the main kid, uh, David, who's the sort of the, the, the graduate Dustin Hoffman as a kid kind of role in the show. If you haven't seen it, please watch it. It's on Amazon Prime. It's fantastic. Maybe we'll get a fourth season six years later if you finally start to watch it. But uh, um, it was just the most satisfying experience. Like, I, I, it didn't even matter if I got the job at that point. It was just so much fun auditioning and it didn't stop. It just kept going. And then he was like, okay, you know what? Let's just do one where you just improvise. And it wasn't like, I was like, I was so floored because say what you will about Canadian television, that doesn't happen that often where I've been lucky enough up here to also get the opportunity to, to you know, bring myself to the table, so to speak. Um, but it's a risk. And, and this year was somebody whose work I, like I just finished watching Eastbound and Down or something. I was kind of starstruck from a director. And uh, he was like, well, improvise. And I really didn't know where to start. Like, I was like, do, do you want to start with a scene? He's like, yeah, okay. And then just go where you want to go. And then we just did that. And we were just like, I was just trying, I was just working a crowd of two people trying to get laughs. And the kid that I had with was, was terrific. And he didn't end up getting the part. It went to Craig Roberts, who's phenomenal and now a filmmaker and uh, brilliant as well. If you haven't seen uh, his work, please look it up. But um, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, yeah. Two weeks later, I'm, I'm you, cause you push it out of your mind and then, and then I get the part. I mean, that's it. And it was all just joy after joy after that. You know what I mean? Like, I got to work with Paul Reiser and Richard Kind and, you know, Jennifer Grey and all these phenomenal people. It was not lost on me how, how, how impactful all these people were. Um, and I think like, you know, Steven Soderbergh came to the table read and I, I, had, I think I said my name, but he introduced, he just went, hi, I'm Steven. And it's like, you don't just say, hi, you're Steven when you're Steve, you, 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 I assume someone like plays trumpets and announces you and then you walk into a room and they unfurl a carpet for you and, like, I think I was like, hi, hi, I, was, I also have a name. I don't remember. Favorite summer drink? Uh, Paloma. Favorite mm. summer spot in Toronto? Anybody's backyard. Favorite summer tradition? Staying for an entire Blue Jays game, no matter how late it goes into extra innings. I, went, I stay on, on Canada Day a couple of years ago. I stayed for an 18-inning baseball game between the Cleveland baseball team and uh, the Jays and it went 18 innings and I was supposed to go to a friend's barbecue. We missed the whole thing, decided to leave. They won it in the top of the 19th. 
19 innings. That's two games. It's insane. Favorite summer memory. When was our date? Valentine's Day? I guess the six month anniversary of our date. Favorite summer karaoke song. I don't know if earlier you were, you heard the part about how I'm not big on musicals, but-, but um, A pop song though. But for the summer? Or any pop song, but yeah, for the summer. You know what? I'll go with the I'll go with the Lover Boy, Billy Ocean. I'd never do it at a karaoke thing, but I would. I imagine that I one day would have the confidence. I would like to be the kind of person who would be like, Billy Ocean, Lover Boy, let's go. There is no ceiling to the creativity of people I know, and even those I don't. It's really like if you look at um, the sheer. Just think about what you thought your world was going to be whether you're doing well or not, the dreams you had, and then to have something, whether it's theater, film, making them, acting in them, whatever it is, um, and then to have this come along. And, the, the, and you know, it's not all been perfect. You, you hear about my stand-up comedian friends of mine doing these comedy shows where they can't tell if anyone's laughing, and if someone laughs, it goes over their next joke. And so it's imperfect, but the drive to entertain and to perform and whatever form it takes, if it's if it's if it's acting, if it's music, it's whatever it is, it's um, it's limitless. It really is limited to your imagination. And I think that's kind of a there's like no lacking of perspective into if you think your your life's not going well to think of people who have it worse than you. It has been, I think, more we, it's an it's an embarrassment of of empathy. And but there's also been an embarrassment of inspiration. And uh, this is an example of it. And I think that that's yeah, that, it, you know, you got to get out of your own way a little bit, maybe sometimes to see it and absorb it and take it in and get inspired by it. But uh, I mean, for me, but uh, yeah, I, the number of times I just see something where I'm like, well, that's, that's, um, that's why you're doing this. That's incredible. You know, I can't count that on two hands Amazing. and I have 30 fingers. So that's a lot of, <laughs> that's a lot. Thanks for joining us on this week's episode of Check In From Away. And it's as Marie later. Cheers. Well, thank you. I just have a few questions for you guys. Now, favorite. Okay, Lisa, we'll start with you. Favorite summer drink? Oh, margarita. Okay. And uh, that's all we have time for. Thank you very much for being on the show. So great to see you guys. Thank you for coming to Behind the Screen, which is what I call this. No, I'm, thank you so much for having me. I'm a real, I'm real, real clown.